So the, the outline of the statistical process today is to start with random graphs and inference problems, right? So we're going to talk about what kind of questions we're trying to ask. We're going to give a solution to get there through randomization. We're going to talk about networks as independent variables. So if I want to use a network feature to predict an outcome, I'm also if I want to know that people who are friends with each other also similarly smoke similarly, that's a network as an independent variable. Um, uh, and we'll talk about ways of doing that. Um, uh, and QAP is probably the first way to do that, but there's some other options we'll get to. Um, uh, and then we're going to talk about networks as dependent variables. So if I want to figure out why two people are tied, and if it's a function, say, of their health status or something like this, um, uh, then we can work on that. And there are lots of different ways that this works. Um, uh, we're going to start with the simplest idea, which is just to build these ideas as we go with a comparison to random graphs, um, uh, parametric models, and then, then end with some cutting edge stuff that's occurring now. The field of random graph modeling and thinking about graphs as if as a, as a, in a statistical sort of probabilistic framework is really, really rich and it's been around for a long time. So from some early mathematical works by Erdos on um, uh, sort of simple random graphs and what it, with the properties of these mathematical objects, from that you get a whole series of distributions of ways of thinking about networks, um, uh, including what we're going to call in the sociological tradition sort of as this stream through here which is the, um, uh, the P1 or the P2 model, all this crazy what those are, P stars and ergums. Um, but there's also this branch that came out of thinking about um, permutation tests and um, so forth. And this is where the QAP and um, Sienna models are coming from. And these things all sort of come together over the course. And so as you might imagine, you can take a, you know, a graduate level seminar for an entire semester on randomized graphs. And so we ain't gonna get that deep in all these pieces, right? So we're gonna sort of gloss over some of the details um, uh, Peter stepped out of the room, which is good because a lot of what I'm going to say is probably like mathematical hearsay. Um, uh, so, but hopefully the ideas are crisp enough um, uh, that you can sort of look up where I'm wrong and go from that. All right. The first point to realize is in, when you think about statistical inference generally, what's the inference you're trying to do? The normal inference problem is you select a sample of cases from a population, you calculate some coefficient on that sample of case, cases, and then you say, well, if my sample is a random draw from the population, I can infer something about the population as a whole. And this is the beauty of random sampling, right? And we have this whole theory about randomization and probability built out of the, that rests on this idea that what I have is a representative or at least a probability-based sample that I can weight back to the population. And the question then is how do I get from my sample to the population? Now what's weird about networks is we have the population, right? That's the first assumption of systematic global network analysis is that I've done a census of the population of inference. So the descriptive statistic is what it is, right? There is no inference problem per se that I'm trying to generate to the population as a whole. That's a, that's a nonsensical question if you've met the first assumption of the network analysis which is you actually have the population. So if I've enumerated every kid in a school and I ask them who's most popular, and I figure out who that is, right? And I build a popularity or a hierarchy in the graph. That graph is what it is, right? And so there is no other population that I might generalize to. So you could just walk away and go home and say, I'm done. I don't I can produce all your papers without p-values or standard errors and like watch your reviewers' heads explode um, uh, and you wouldn't get um, uh, tenure and all the rest of this. So we want to think about this a little bit more substantively. And I think, in fact, most of the time when we ask a, an inference problem, what we're really asking isn't, is this true in the population per se? We're actually asking, is this more, like, is this real? Is the effects we're finding more than we might expect by chance or some other kind of like randomized feature. And that's the kind of inference that we do on networks. So on networks, what we're asking is we observe some feature in the graph in these really complicated mathematical high dimensional structures. We might find, for example, that there's a correlation between popularity and wealth. We would like to know if that correlation is just due to random chance. Right? So what we want to do is we want to compare our observed network to a random network. And the random network we're going to compare to in this case right, is, is really where all the, all the work comes in. It's trying to figure out what that randomness really should be. Because it, as, um, it's a, it ends up being a much more complicated problem than you might expect. All right. Well, maybe you guys might expect it. Now, the one way to think about this, um, there are actually two ways of thinking about this. Um, I, and this is, in, in, the, in the math world, you can think about a graph of size n with an edge value probability p, or you can think of a set of all graphs of size n with m edges. These are slightly different mathematical objects. For our standpoint, they're about the same. That is that you can imagine thinking about the network you've observed as one draw from the population of all networks of the same size of the network that you've observed. 
Put your head around that for a minute, right? So, so that, oh, what Molly showed us on, uh, was it just yesterday? Tuesday. Um, uh, what Molly showed us on, on Tuesday was the triad census, right? So remember a triad census is the set of all possible patterns on 16, um, uh, of the 16, you get these 16 triads, that's the set of all possible patterns on a three node graph on a directed sort of network, right? So there are 16 ways that I can arrange three nodes if I allow them to have directed ties between each other. Turns out there's something like 10, 100 million ways when you get to um, get different patterns of 10 nodes in a network, right? But what we're doing, if we pull out a three node network, we say, oh, that's a 300 triad in the MAN map, map modeling standpoint. That's one draw from the set of 16 possible networks that could be there. And what you want to think about is that I've sampled a school of 600 kids. Where does this school fit in the distribution of all net possible networks that have 600 nodes and say something like you know, 30,000 edges. Right? So that kind of a, of a question is the inference problem you want to think about. And it turns out that you can't enumerate the population of graphs unless it's, more, you know, when it, when it, unless it's a very small number of graphs. And so what that means then is we need some way to sample from the space of graphs even though we don't have the population frame to draw from. And the way we do that is with a construction procedure generally. If the work that we're doing, right, in terms of building our graph is systematic enough, we can ensure that the process of generating that graph is going to give us a valid draw from the distribution of all graphs in the world. And I'm going to ask you to trust me that that sentence is true. I'm also going to like you to know that, that, that getting that piece right, that is constructing the graph that is actually random and, and, and matches the graph we want to in a real way, is really hard to do very well, and it's really easy to screw it up. And so you got to think carefully about how you do this construction process in a way that you get a valid comparison. So for example, it's really easy to build a random network that oversamples, say, closed triads in the network. And, that, and then you're going to compare a network that, that you think is the random null to the network that's real, and you'll make a wrong inference about whether or not your network is different from what we'd assume it should be. Right? So this is why we're going through the process of describing what they are. Questions, comments, thoughts thus far? Where we're going? This is a lot at 9 in the morning, and I get it. It's like jumping in at both feet. It's not, we're going to start high today and sort of work our way down as we go. All right. So what's nice about Erdos random graphs, so an Erdos random graph is you imagine an n by n adjacency matrix. Each cell in that adjacency matrix has a probability p, and I flip a coin. Right? I go through. If it's a 0.25 probability, one out of four times that edge will be 1. Right? Three out of four times that edge will be 0. And you just do that. If you do that a process, we know a lot about that mathematically. Right? We know, for example, that if you do that and you generate a random graph, or that it's a Bernoulli random graph, you'll end up with a Poisson distribution of the degree. Right? That's a mathematical result that's out in the world. We know it's true, and we can compare these things. Right? And so it's nice because the actual construction process is fairly straightforward. It's literally each cell of that adjacency matrix is independent. We just flip a coin. And the only question is whether or not we weight that coin. Those networks have really nice features to them, right? So it turns out that if you have a relatively, if you have a completely random graph, we know there's things about the macro structure of the graph that has to emerge. So for example, you always get what's known as a giant component if you're above a certain um, a degree. If you have, if each person has more than two, just a little bit more than two um, uh, ties on average, you will always get a giant connected component. If you have less than that, you won't get it. In fact, this is what this curve looks like. If you're, or sorry, so it's an average degree of one if each person has, if they're, the density is two. So if you end up with an average degree of one, just over one, right, you'll see that they disconnected, 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 and then pow, right, you get connectivity. And if you've never played with these, this kind of a growth model on networks, it's kind of a fun thing to do. Why is that not? Come on, there, come on. Um, so this is, come on, man. All right, let's load it back up again. Yeah, maybe I don't have it for it. Oh, there we go. I thought I had it set up. So if you can imagine I'm taking how this process works, how this sort of emergence of a giant component comes out of nowhere, imagine I have, in this case, I don't know, a few hundred. What did I just set this up as? I set this one up as having um, set up the number of nodes. That's 80 nodes. Let's give it, I don't know, a network of about 200 nodes. Right? So I got a bunch of people in the network. 
And then I'm going to randomly just assign an edge in this network, right? So I'm going to go once. So there I've assigned an edge between those people and those people, right? So if I'm going to do this for 100, this is going to get kind of um, annoying. So I'll just tell it to go. Notice down here, you see the size of the connected component as it grows. And what happens when you randomly add edges to the network is you get lots of little isolated dyads at first. But when those dyads connect across, you get a component that starts to connect, right? So this starts to grow a little bit, right? I'm going to speed this up just a hair, just because I'm getting tired of watching it. It goes, and it goes, and again, it just peters along here because there's lots of empty, isolated people to connect to, and so you don't get a whole lot of connectivity. But pretty soon, you're going to exhaust this set of isolated folks, and you're going to have isolated dyads left. And so every time you create an edge, you're going to get at least three people. And then you're going to connect those to four people, and eight people, and 12 people. And before you know it, the entire network ends up getting connected. And this is what happens in the random Bernoulli process. Because if you're flipping the, network, the, the coins over and over and over again, you get these phase transitions and a rapid rise to connectivity um, uh, with very little effort. So what we want to be able to do is think about what it is about the process of the network that might generate these kind of macro features. And in this case, this is the simplest possible random process. It's literally a coin fig, and everybody and every cell in the adjacency matrix, adjacency matrix has the same probability. All right, so then... Um, Sorry, this machine does a weird uh, mirroring that I'm trying to get over. All right, so um, the, the, the simple random is, of course, a poor model for real life. And this is, this is why, though it's a really nice mathematical model, it doesn't match most things about the world, right? So the idea is that we, instead of having a simple random model, we want to have a conditional random model. So we want to have an adjacency matrix that essentially we slice and sort in various ways, and so that each cell of the finest slicing and sorting is a simple random graph, and it combined all together, you get something that's more comparable to the real world. And as a simple way to think about this, you might imagine, for example, that I have an observed um, a network that's where I've divided the population by race, um, uh, and in this case, we have white students, black students, and a mix or others, and we know the density, that is the probability of a tie occurring within each group and between each group, right? So what I could do is set up a random Bernoulli graph where I create an adjacency matrix that has the same number of nodes as I've observed in my real graph, the same number of white students, the same number of black students, the same number of mixed students, and then I create a coin flip in each of these cells on the adjacency matrix and generate that. And if I do that, I get another graph, right? So this is a network that matches, right, on the mixing. So this is what's called a mixing matrix, is what this thing is. And I've generated a random graph that matches on the mixing matrix but it doesn't end up matching on the degree distribution, right? So the, uh, the random network ends up with this degree distribution. The observed network has this degree distribution. And so it fits in one part of the network, right? So now I've matched on racial mixing in this setting, but I haven't matched on degree. And so that's probably a problem, and I need to go in and fix that. But that's the logic of what we're going to do as this day goes on. Now, you can think about other things that I might um, uh, sort of fix on this, so I can actually fix on degree, and I'm going to give you more of these slides as we go on. But if in an observed school network, for example, if I do those little trace plots I showed you yesterday, sort of going through the network, start with one person, see how many they can reach, see how many they can reach, see how many they can reach, that trace plot looks like this if everybody in the network has, it has a degree two, if they have a degree three, degree four, this is what a random network would look like with that degree distribution on, a, on, a, on a, in this case, a fixed degree. And you can compare that to an actual observed network, right? So if, a so if I take the, uh, the average degree in a network and I generate that, right, the random network looks like this. I reach lots of people. By the time I get to four steps, I reach everyone in the population. In the observed network, if I, do a, if I look at the distribution of all those traces, on average, by the time I get four steps, I only reach about 50% of the population. I have to go out to six degrees of separation before I reach 90% of the population. Why do you suppose that is? What would make it harder to reach lots of other people in the network by just sort of trace out through the network in a real world network that you wouldn't see in a purely random network? Any ideas? Please. So there's lots of little clusters in the network. Exactly. Right. So what happens is in a one step, I don't reach that many new people, or sorry, in two steps, I don't reach that many new people. 
because all the friends that I've reached are friends with each other. So those networks cluster back in on each other. And so this local clustering means that observed networks always have longer um, uh, trace curves than random networks. And in fact, it's a nice way to compare an observed network to a, uh, uh, an observed network to a random network is to think about the distance between these features. And so the point is that you end up with these things called um, a small world network. So most real world networks are, have this small world structure where most people are, are friends with each other. They have these little sort of cliques that you're friends with. And there are some ties that cross across at random across this set. And there's a broad class of these networks. This is from the classic paper that um, uh, uh, Duncan Watts published, where you have, you imagine the, the number of steps it takes to reach everyone in the network, right, which is this little black dot and the number of, um, uh, the amount of clustering in the network, the likelihood that friends are friends with each other, and there's this space in the, um, uh, in the, in the world where it's, you have a much more clustering than you'd expect by chance and much shorter distance than you'd expect by chance. And that's characteristic of real social networks. That people tend to have, um, uh, be friends with each other, but you can often reach people some from far away because, um, and there's some good sociological reasons that I'm gonna ignore in the interest of time. Um, so how do we think then about a random graph? So one way to think about the random graph that I've told you thus far is this simple coin flip. And a lot of software does this because it's so easy to do. So if you can imagine looking at an observed triad census, right? This is the number of triads, these 16 triads that Molly was telling about us before. If I just flip a coin, right, I would have expected to observe, instead of 39,000 of these, I would have, should have seen 37,000. Instead of 12 of this one, I should have seen 0.03, right? So I, you see that I see many more of these dense triads than I would expect by chance if I just flipped the coin. But of course, just flipping the coin is a bad model. So instead, what I might do is I might condition on the number of mutual ties in the network, right? So if I'm in one school where kids are, have a high level of reciprocity, then I'm gonna force myself down here to these more clustered triads because I'm gonna have more of the mutual um, uh, triads than I would observe by triads otherwise. And so it turns out that some kinds of distributions, like the uniform distribution given the number of mutual asymmetric or null ties, that's what U bar man means, um, uh, is mathematically tractable. It's an ugly formula. It's actually like 16 different formulas, right? One for each triad. But you can actually just calculate the probability of observing this pattern in the network um, a conditional on the number of mutual ties that are observed and the number of asymmetric ties that are observed and the number of null ties that are observed. And if you think about this, this is because the triad distribution is really just a count of the number of all null ties, all single asymmetric ties, all mutual ties, right? And so once I know that count, and I know the state space of the networks, which is in choose three for the triad distribution, I can just map them onto each other. And it's a lot of like, you know, I gotta cross your T's and, and, and cancel out some things, but it's not, it's not intellectually a complex problem, and it is tractable. All right, and so then you can ask yourself, do I observe more transitive triads, a friend of a friend of the friend, right? Do, I, um, uh, do kids tend to avoid things like these really intransitive sets where A is a close friend with B, B is a close friend with C, but A and C dislike each other? And you can compare that then, given the distribution, to what you observe in a real school network compared to random, right? And what you find is that real world networks tend to have much more clustered um, uh, triads. You observe many more of those than you would expect by chance. And you observe fewer of these kind of, um, uh, where, did it, where did it go? I lost it now. Yeah, this guy, right? So you, if you, this close friends that disagree, you always observe that much less than you would expect by chance. And this is the kind of thing that you can do. And in fact, Eugene Johnson has a really wonderful um, uh, set of papers that let you um, describe an actual macro structure of the network that comes out of triads. You can compare the observed distribution of triads in your network to, the, to these, these pre-proposed models, sort of a classic bureaucratic hierarchy versus a cluster hierarchy and so forth. And you can ask, do I observe more of one type than the other? And in the PROSPER data, we tend to find um, this is the most, the, the, the model that fits the best is a hierarchical, is a set of hierarchical cliques that are separated by into, into multiple different tracks. It, these are kids, right? And this, these are using the, the junior high and younger sort of levels. And so these two cliques are probably boys and girls, right? And so this fits really well in the, for the younger kids. For the high school kids, once, once kids realize that boys are not, and girls are not yucky, yucky to each other, you get a unified hierarchy. That goes like this, right? So this is the kind of thing you can do descriptively to compare a simple distribution to, some, to a model. The problem is, once you get past something like the U-man distribution, sort of dyad features, or some very simple features like mixing on, a, on an observed dyad, it's really hard to compare your network simultaneously with the others. So let's imagine for a minute 
that I'd like to have not just the number of mutual asymmetric and, and null ties that I condition on, but I'd also like to condition on the, de on the degree distribution. Some people in my network have many more ties than others in the network. There is no tractable closed form formula for building that random null. So that's why we got to move to simulation. And this is what this, this idea has been around for at least 50 years, but we've only recently had the computational power to do it. All right? So what I want to walk through is a way in which we can construct some of these graphs to make this possible. And a common way to do it is something called a zipper method. And the idea is that imagine I have person, I have the degree distribution. People can have one tie, two ties, three ties. So one person has two ties, two people have two ties, and one person have three ties. So that means my network has a total of five people in it, right? So I have A through D or A, B, C, D, E. Why do I have F? No, that's, I just didn't put an E in. That's why. Okay. <laughs> that was really starting to worry me for a minute. I was like, this example should work. So in order to get that, what you do is you create these little half edges, right? So there's two people in my population that have degree one. So I say, here's person A out there. They have degree one. Their edge goes out in the world. It's not linked to anybody yet, but it's sitting out there waiting to get linked to somebody, right? Person B is the same way. Their link's out in the world. It's waiting to get linked to somebody, but it's not linked yet. Person C has two of those links out in the world. They haven't reached anybody yet. Person D has two. They're out there in the world reaching somebody. And F has three of them. All right, so then I just line up these things. I, pick, I randomly pick half of them, put them on one side of a, of a column, put the other half, randomly put them on the other, sort them, join them together. So now I have a randomly mixed network where the edges are, are linked by the fact that everyone's degree now is perfectly matched to what it was originally. Right? But then you end up having um, a degree distribution that matched on, on a perfectly random set. But there's one problem, right? If you do this on this kind of a network, network of this size, it's very likely that F's going to tie to themselves, right? So there are some kind of things you have to, some tricks you have to do to make sure that you don't end up people having self loops or the fact that maybe F will have um, uh, two ties to C or something like this. So if there are other constraints in the network, you have to build little sub loops in to fix that. And that's where you can get really problematic. It's really easy to write a sub loop to fix a problem that takes you out of the random draw space, right? So this is why um, uh, this problem isn't much of a problem once your network gets really big because the probability of having a self loop when you have 100,000 nodes in the network is just vanishingly small. It's ignorable. Um, but when you have small networks, you need to be careful about how that works. Right? And so this is an example of a, of a, a network we did um, uh, using this method to um, look at to, to take a degree distribution that we've observed in a real network, in this case commercial sex workers um, uh, in uh, Shanghai, and actually generate from that a, a network of all the relations amongst commercial sex workers once we think about, once we scale up that degree distribution to the population that, a size that we think is going on in Shanghai, right? So this is the kind of thing you can do. Now, we are certain this is wrong, like all models, right? I'm certain that the real network has some spatial elements built into it. It has some um, probably sex work type built into it and things like this that are not accounted for here. But it's a way to help you think about a process and a setting. And that's the logic that's going to occur the rest of the day. Questions, thoughts, concerns thus far? Clears mud? Awesome. All right. So you, the answer to the inference problem is to construct a reasonable approximation to your observed setting or social processes and compare. And so what you typically do is um, you build up a series of models. And the, there are no old farts in the room. But if you're old enough, um, uh, you would remember these things called log linear models. And in a lot, the, the classic way you fit a log linear model is a log linear model is a way to build, to fit a model to a contingency. Now, now I really am dating myself. It's a way to fit a model to a contingency table, right? So a cross tab. And then it was, it was used traditionally for mobility models. So if you have your social class from lower class to, to elite class, and you can say, what's the probability that if my father was elite, I'm also going to be elite, right? So these are the kind of things you could do. Um, and then people did in the 50s. And the way you built those models is you say, well, Let's start with the simplest possible model. We'd fit the marginal. So given the, the marginal distribution, the number of people in the row, the number of people in the columns, kind of fit the middle. And you would build these models by adding more and more constraints. So first I would fit the marginals, and then I might fit the diagonal. And then I might say that it's a smooth line out of the diagonal. Or I might say there's a class break between middle class and upper class that's harder to groove than the other. And the worst, the, the, what's known as the saturated models, I can fit a specific probability to each cell in that model. Well, if you take your head out of the log linear contingency table and replace that table with an adjacency matrix, that's exactly what we're going to do, right? We're going to take that kind of logic and apply it um, uh, to uh, these pieces. Now, this is, uh, when I say here in the slide that there are lots of reasonable ways to do this, you're, you're going to see there's many different ways you could do this. 
All right. So we're going to come to that piece in a bit. Um, first, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, flipping the script a, a little bit and think about networks as independent variables, right? So if I want to use a network to predict something else, um, uh, you can use the same kind of randomization process, but it ends up being a little bit simpler, right? And so in order to do this, we, the, the, the standard version of this is called the quadratic assignment procedure, QAP. Um, people call it QAP model. I don't know if that's, there's no U in it, so I'm not sure that it should be QAP as opposed to CAP, but um, that's, that's what it is. Um, so as you might ask yourself, for example, if you're interested in studying the 14th century Florentine um, families, which I'm sure all of us are deeply interested in, um, uh, whether or not marriage ties correlate um, uh, with business ties amongst the Medici, or are friendship relations correlated with joint membership in a club? These are the kind of questions you can ask. Or you might ask, if people who smoke, um, uh, do, if we both smoke, are we also more likely to be friends? Right? Are people who are using um, uh, PrEP, are they more likely to discuss matters um, uh, about HIV prevention than people who are not? Right? And so you can think about these things um, uh, as, as one leading to the other. And the way you do it is you take whatever relation you have on the one side, in this case, are people married, does that predict doing business together? You can imagine having these um, uh, matched adjacency majors. Now, they, it's really important they're matched, right? So sort your data. Um, but in the case here, right, so I know that I have one set of ties, right, where I know that the bottom row is this T family that I can't pronounce, um, uh, and the bottom row in the business network is also the T family. And so then what you do is you just simply construct a very simple um, uh, array out of this matrix, right? You just take each dyadic element of this, you put it in from 1 to 2, 1 to 3, 1 to 4, 2 to 1, 2 to 3, 2 to 4, and you array the dyads and create the correlation. Now, you don't have to use the correlation, you can use the odds ratio, you can use whatever your favorite statistic is, right? Um, uh, to do it, it doesn't matter. This is just an ill, so don't get on me for using a Pearson correlation on a binary variable. Um, but the idea is that I've observed a correlation of 0.37. Is that big? Maybe, right? We can have some rules of thumb. We can talk about it. We can um, uh, get into deep arguments over beer about whether or not it should be 0.37 versus 0.47. Or we can say, let's compare it to something that's reasonable and see if it, if it really is big. And so the common way to do this is called a permutation test. And so you would take one of those matrices and you would randomly sort the rows and columns in the same way, hold the other one constant, and now compare the observed network to the um, uh, a randomly sorted network. In this case, you know there can be no social effect, right? So now what you're doing is saying, but there might be marginal effect because there's a, the degree is different and so forth. So there's there's reason to think that it might not necessarily be a zero correlation or a zero odds ratio. Um, and we can do this, right? We can do this, you know, lots and lots of times. So you have your original matrix, you sort it. Um, uh, so it used to be A B C D, now it's A D B C, right? And you do this over and over again, and you sort of you calculate the observed correlation for k iterations. You do this random sorting. You recalculate the correlation. You store the outcome. You compare the observed correlation to the other one. And this is what you might get, right? So in this case, I do that. I get a distribution of correlations on the set. And I discover that my observed correlation, 0.37, is way out here on the tail, right? And so this is a case where I would say 0.37 is a pretty big number, right? Compared to a reasonable random null, which is the permuted adjacency matrix. And the reason I say it's a, re a reasonable random null is that all the marginals are the same, the dyad features are the same, like lots of the features are retained when you keep the, uh, when you do the permutation, so all the degree things and so forth are the same. The only thing you've done is break the association between um, uh, the correlate between business and marriage in this case. All right. And there are lots of um, uh, pieces that do this. So UCINet does it nice. There's a program in R that um, uh, uh, we'll show you this afternoon that does it. This is an old slide, but um, uh, you can do it for whatever you want. And if what's nice about this way of thinking is that it provides you a first pass the post kind of way of exploring the data. It's computationally pretty efficient, um, uh, and it's a way to get you a sense of what's there. Um, uh, and, it's, um, uh, and you can do it for really any kind of modeling strategy, right? So correlation is easy, but you could do it for regression coefficients. You could do it for um, uh, multi-level models if you were patient enough to do this kind of thing, right? So there are ways of doing it. Turns out we don't have to do it all the time, but you can. So for example, I might want to I'm going to take um, uh, whether or not people are um, uh, the same race or the same sex, compare that to whether or not they're friends or not. I can, um, uh, uh, might have some dependent variable, which is say how often they um, uh, you know, bet on horses. I don't know, I made that up. I guess if I were, um, uh, maybe this is their libido, um, uh, right? And so we can see how different their libido is, just to go off of um, Brea Perry's example. Um, and so if this is, so if y is your dependent variable, why did I do that? Right, so if y is your dependent variable, I can convert any vector dependent variable into a difference. And so now I can say whether or not our features on this network predict our similarity or our difference on this outcome. Right? So are two people 
um, who are friends more likely to vote, vote the same way or to have the same opinion on some scale? That's the kind of question this answers. And it turns out, again, you can use QAP regression to do this. Um, uh, US UCI Net has a bunch of nice tools for doing that. Um, uh, is in fact, um, uh, really um, uh, does a nice job and does it quickly. Um, but you get something that looks like this. Do I have it? There we go. Right, where you get a model R square. And in this case, you can't see this. I'm sorry at the back. But we find out that you know, being friends right, means you have a low, it's a negative coefficient there. It's just two pixels. pixels. I need to zoom this in somehow. But so it's a negative effect on, um, uh, the, uh, on this distance in Y. The p-value is 0 0.00. This is a permutation p-value. This is the proportion of times that the coefficient was as big as you observed in your network or as small as, your net, as you observed in your network. So essentially, how, how many cases are outside on the tail that you know, that permutation test, and you get a, a standard error out of this. So it's a really nice way to get a clean association measure. And this is all just associations at this point. It's all observational. Um, uh, and you can do it for being the same um, race, the same sex, um, uh, being um, uh, adjacent to each other, and so forth. Right? So this is it's a very nice way, if you have any kind of, of um, uh, sort of dyadic feature, to compare that to a similarity on an outcome. Make sense how this works? We're going to do another way to do it. The problem with this, of course, is that the, there's um, the QAP as a random as a randomized set ends up being a pretty simple test, right? It's it's pretty easy to pass a QAP test, kind of like Peter said yesterday. If you can't pass this test, go home, um, because we know that the social world isn't certainly random, right? And so there are better versions of QAP. So you can do a nested QAP. I could say that I'm going to hold constant the association by um, race and only do the mixture within race, right? So only permute with the, the rows and columns within race or something like this. And so there are ways to, to, to make this more sophisticated. But again, the whole idea of a permutation test is because I can't write down that formula. I can't write down that, that, that conditional feature of the random graph. I need some way to compare it to. And what we do is a computation approach. Permutations are nice because it actually gives us the actual inference we care about, which is that if I have a social process, compare it to a random process, are they the same? And if we do it, and there's and there's lots of ways you can construct the random process, but that's the idea. Questions, thoughts? Seems sensible. Again, you can do QAP in um, uh, uh, in R, at least simple QAP. If you really want to do some of the, um, uh, uh, if, if you're doing basic network stuff, um, this is one of the times. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not hating on UCI Net. It's that I don't typically use it that often. But the one time that it really is good is for doing QAP kind of models because they've invested a lot of time getting the software right so the sorting happens correctly. And they have logits, they have um, uh, probits, they have um, uh, OLS regressions. There are lots of different ways of doing basic models um, uh, that allow you then to do these things quickly. Whereas you can write that little um, piece that I told you about before, that little, for that little formula. Um, uh, but most of us, if you do that, say, with a regression, you're going to be there all day. Please, right. Uh, this is just to make sure that I'm on the right page. Yeah. Exactly. So if you, if you, the, the beauty of the QAP is that if your question is about the association between two things, the beauty of the randomization is it holds most of the features of the network constant. So, my, so you always have a person with high degree. They're just moving around on what they do. Exactly. Right. And so by breaking that association, you end up able to test whether or not what you see is sort of in the range of what would happen if the world were random. And it's um, subject to sample size. Um, the, the sample size in this case, um, uh, no, because remember, the, the, uh, the thinking is you have the population, right? So remember, you have the population. So the sample size is how patient are you waiting for QAP iterations, right? So um, uh, in the bad old days, I would say, you know, do a couple hundred, um, uh, and you know, that'll give you time to go get lunch and come back, and um, uh, uh, you'll be fine. Now we routinely do four or 5,000 um, uh, just to let it run. And, I, anything over a thousand is probably fine. Um, uh, it's it really is just it's 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 the um, the more complicated your model, the harder and the and essentially the higher the the multicollinearity amongst the independent variables of your model. If you think about it this way, when you have, when you have something more than a correlation, the more information you need to tease out the independent effect of one or the other, and the more noise you're going to have in the overall set. So if you have high multicollinearity, you might bump this up to two or three thousand, but. Like literally, in UCI Net, I can run a QAP on a network of a thousand nodes, and it'll run in an hour, right? Whereas, or, and and it'll run a thousand iterations in an hour. Whereas before, that would have like been truly impossible. 
So the ability to do this now is, is, is feasible and you know, run it for a small number of things when you're exploring and before you get ready to publish paper, dump that sucker up really high, go to bed, come back the next morning and you'll have a nice converged set. Please. The, the, the coefficients are interpreted exactly the same way as you would in any other model, right? So there is no difference in the coefficient itself. So if you're doing an OLS regression, it's a one unit change in Y, gives you a coefficient change in X. You're doing a logit, it's a log odds. If you're doing a probit, it's a change in the normal distribution set, right? So you can think about what these pieces are exactly like your model. So there's absolutely no difference. The issue is you're calculating um, uh, the, the coefficient Right, without any standard errors. None of the standard error features are there. We, we ignore all the parametric standard errors. We don't even, we don't even bother calculating them. So for this model, what is the uh, dependent variable? This is a dependent variable I made up. This is, this, is, this is just like literally, it's a number that I made up that I knew would work. <laughs> so, but you can, I should have picked a real example, but I was too late. <laughs> Which, is, which says something like when you get to the point where it's easier to like program a Monte Carlo um, uh, for a made up example as opposed to like go and get the data. Probably speaks deeply to my inherent nerdness, but um, there we go. All right, so now I'm gonna shift back. Now that we have this idea of permutation in our head and this modeling, I'm gonna shift back to a, a way of thinking about um, uh, modeling a network as a dependent variable, okay? Um, uh, so the way we model a network as a dependent variable is, it is to go on to this, um, uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna mix these two ideas. We're gonna start with this log linear notion I gave you before, and then we're gonna add to it a, um, uh, something like a permutation test. In this case, it's called an MCMC -MC chain. That is where we sort of simulate things lots and lots of times in order to get um, uh, the underlying answer. But we're gonna get to that part way later. We're gonna start first with just the conceptual idea of what we're doing. So let's imagine, right, in a world, right, in a world where you have a network, um, uh, of just a dozen people that I can fit on a screen. Um, uh, you might get a network that looks something like this, right? And in the real world network, like in the real population, like this adjacency matrix has three values. It has irrelevant, right, along the diagonal. So these are NA, um, uh, or just not part of the sample set. And you're either on in red or you're off in blue, right? So it's an observed binary network. It's adjacent for one or the other. And what we would like to do now is think about what predicts having a tie between two people versus something that doesn't have a tie between two people. And for most of us, this is a pretty common kind of problem. This is something like a logit model, right? And so you can imagine that the tie between i and j is a function of some overall intercept. Um, in this case, it's a j coefficient, so this is a, a, a receiver co effect. But then you might have some a, a sender effect, a receiver effect, a dyadic effect, and maybe something else that's really specific to um, a, a subset of nodes or something. And so that, but that's the logic we're gonna go to. And if you sort of step aside for a minute and don't get all hung up on standard errors because we're gonna fix those with the permutation set, then this is really, it really is just sort of a logic problem. So we're gonna build this model in the simplest way. So let's start by thinking that we have an intercept only model, right? So an intercept only model says that yij is just a function of the intercept, right? And so in that case, if you think about what the model's predicting, the model's predicting a same thing for every possible cell. Right? Sometimes it hits, right, here in the bold ones, sometimes it misses. Right? But it really is just the case that all we're doing is saying that there is a random chance that um, uh, I'm going to predict a tie. The density in this network is 0.24, so the probability of a tie in any given set is 0 0.24. It's a bad model. You know it's a bad model. It's going to admit it's going to miss um, uh, this tie, you know, four out of, uh, three out of four times. Right? So let's add some more information. I can add some sender effects, right? So sender effects in this case, would be for each row, I'm just gonna add their degree, right, as a covariate in the model. So in this case, I'm gonna say that this person has a lower probability of getting a tie because in this row of the adjacency matrix, right, the density now is 0.13. So it's conditional on the row in this case. And this person has a very high out degree, five, so we expect five of these ties, so this is a little over half of the ties in this row should be one. So we can treat that as the model. That could be all we do. And you just kind of see where this is going, right? I could do column effects. I could say, let's take receiver effects. Some people are not very popular, right? They only receive one tie. Other people are very popular. They receive four. I can do both. Right? So now you're getting a pretty specific model, right? With just out degree and in degree in the model, um, uh, I managed to identify some of these nodes have a really high probability of being tied, right? Because we can see that the, this, is a, this, this node has a very high out degree, right? So the, the row marginal is high column marginal is high, so the intersection is gonna be very high as well. 
That's all this is saying, right? But it also misses from time to time, right? So we're predicting a pretty low tie here, this 0.27, um, uh, even though it is a tie. And we're also predicting some places, like right, um, uh, where we predict about 0.4 over in these pieces, where there is no tie, um, uh, even though so we're going to get a tie here more often than we would get in these other cells, even though we know that's actually zero. So how might we fix that? Well, we could add some kind of dyadic feature. Right? We could say that we're both male, or we're both female, or we're both white, or we're both black, or we're both Republicans, or we're both Democrats. Right? So any dyadic feature I can add to the model will take these marginal effects and make them more specific. And that specificity then allows you to take into, is usually the kind of thing we care about socially. Are we both smokers? Are we both you know, drug users? What is the thing that brings us into the population that we care about from a health standpoint and drive it? And the model then does pretty good. Right? Um, uh, the bold cells end up having a high probability, right, sort of in these features. Um, but also we do, we still miss, right? And so this is what you have to do from an exploratory standpoint is to try to figure out whether or not I've hit these pieces or not. Does that make sense? Uh, we also get both false positives and false negatives. Um, uh, we miss both because it's a poor model and because it's a poor estimation. And so we, the logit model, um, uh, it turns out, does a really good job of some kinds of features. Which we're, the features we're going to call dyadic independent features and not so good on others. And we'll get to that in a second. All right. So a key twist on the simple model is that while we work with dyads, right, the model is really of the entire network. So now I want to remember I want to take us back to that thing I told us at the very beginning of this session, which is that what we really want to do, because we have the population, right, we don't have a sample of dyads. We have a network we've observed. And that network is one draw from the universe of possible networks with the features that are characteristic of our network. And our task as analysts is to figure out what those features are. In this case, then, we want to ask whether the graph um, in question is an element of the graph of all possible ones. And so we can do that um, uh, uh, with, we can substitute that by using this logit model. And so what we're doing, I should have made this bridge better. In the first slide, I told you that there's, there's two ways of thinking about these graphs. Right, of course, I made a third slide. Um, uh, you can have a graph with n nodes and m edges, right, which is a constant way of thinking about it. Or you can think about it as a graph with n nodes and p edges. And, or with edges of probability p. That's that second version we're doing. We're letting p vary across each cell of this matrix based on some model features. And so that's the modeling idea. And what's nice about this is that we can end up um, building a model right, um, uh, for, uh, for all kinds of graphs based on these types of, uh, uh, of networks. And um, the first version of this is one that Holland and Linner came out with, I think, in the late 60s, 67 or 68. Um, uh, where they, they call it the P1 model. And in this case, you have an intercept for each person, for each sender. You have a coefficient for each receiver. And you have a coefficient for each diet. Or, or you have a, a value for each diet and one coefficient here. So in this case, on a network that is, has n, by n times n minus 1 dyads, you're going to have 2n plus 1 coefficients. Right? That's not a very efficient model. Right? So you're going to be estimating, you know, if you have 100 nodes in your network, for this model, you're going to be estimating 201 coefficients, right? Now that's okay because you have 900 dyads, so you haven't completely exhausted your degrees of freedom, but it's still a pretty cumbersome model. But the, even though it's a cumbersome model, there are some things that are kind of fun about it. Um, uh, so once you have this modeling framework, you can ask yourself, right, um, uh, what the attractiveness parameters are, which is the, the receiver effects, or the um, expansiveness parameters. And so if you think about the expansiveness parameters, this is how social a person is. Like, are you a wallflower or a social butterfly? Um, uh, the the um, uh, attractiveness parameter is how often do people come at you? Are you really popular or are you not so popular? And this is a reciprocity parameter for Holland and uh, Leinhardt. And if you run this model and you see INET or some other places, what's nice is you get a coefficient for each person, right? And they have some omitted ones because these people have um, uh, were unestimable because they were, they were there's zeros, um, uh, but we get this coefficient, and you can compare the expansiveness from the model to the um, out degree. So some people, from a modeling standpoint, it looks like they should be really socially active, but their degree is actually low, and that's because most of the out ties that they have are, are um, uh, based on reciprocity, right? And so the, by controlling for reciprocity, we can disentangle how popular I am from how expansive I am which is kind of fun, right? So I can find people who the model says should be really popular, but don't get lots of ties, right? That's the sense in which that their social world is being driven by this reciprocity effect overall. And if it weren't for reciprocity, right, if the, fact, the fact is it's just they don't have enough, they, they, all of their ties have been soaked up 
by the reciprocity features, they don't have more that they could give out. So it's a very nice modeling effect, and it's one way that often, and a lot of this is taken up from the, uh, uh, it's a nice way of identifying, especially on the expansiveness side, um, things where you're, the capping of your um, instrument might create differences. But again, this is a very simple model, super, super simple. But it, the beauty of simple models is that you can make them more complex, right? And so you can always add things to them. And so I might decide, for example, that I have the basic um, model here where I have a single reciprocity parameter. Let's say that the reciprocity varies by groups. So males and females have different levels of reciprocity. So I can have one parameter of reciprocity within groups, another parameter of reciprocity between groups. Right? I might say that there is a, um, a node attribute that I'm going to add to this model. Right? So I could add, I don't know why that's the same. Oh, yeah, I just added it there. Right? So it might be that I'm adding like, something uh, about whether you're, you're um, rich or poor or something. Right? Um, the key is to ensure the specification doesn't imply a linear dependency of terms, right? So it is possible. Um, the one thing you have to be a little careful with here is that, um, like, the mean out degree, it has to be equal to the mean in degree because it's just a cross tab. So you, have to, so you lose a degree of freedom every time you do this, and if you add reciprocity, you've lost another degree of freedom. Um, so there are some combinations of parameters that I can add that will lead to linear dependencies that you might not expect. So you just have to be aware of that when you're building the model. If you run this um, in some places, and you have, for say, if you were to run this on an health and add health, for example, on the entire um, set of wave one schools, you would discover that like over half the schools would fall out because those people are, were limited to out degree one, and it, right, and so like they did, there's no degree of freedom there. The model couldn't be estimated for those schools. All right. The other thing about these models, it's not so bad for most of these kinds of parameters, but once I start adding in, um, but reciprocity and certainly transitivity and other kinds of social closer features. The um, standard errors in these cases are approximate, which is a nice way to say they're usually pretty bad. <laughs> so you got to think a little carefully about what those things are. And so the solution to this problem is something called exponential random graph models, or at least historically, this has been the solution that we've, we've, we've moved on to, which is can we get out of this, this, this approximation of the standard errors to get something that's a little more accurate? And we can do that um, by specifying a model um, uh, that has this kind of form, which is that we observe some network X, and we ask, what's the probability that X is a member of the class of all graphs of category X, um, uh, where X is defined as um, uh, a series of parameters on, a, on um, uh, some score in the network. So this is a parameter that defines the network. This is a score on the network. And we can define all, all networks, say, if, if this score is just the number of nodes, then this would be the, a parameter that, is, that describes the probability of observing this graph Right, as a function of the graph of all nodes of this size. So this is the idea here. Now the beauty is that the z could be usually something more interesting than size, right? It could be reciprocity, it could be racial mixing, it could be the, the likelihood that people smoke. All and, and that, so, we, so we're going to spend a lot of time thinking about what this particular feature is. Um, and then if we normalize it by something that adds up over the class of all possible graphs, then we get a real probability. Sounds great, right? So I know there are 16 possible um, uh, three node networks, um, I can enumerate them all. If I have um, a graph of 100 um, uh, nodes, then I know that there are in choose three um, uh, triads in the network, and I can assign them various pieces, and I know exactly what this normalizing constant should be. The problem is, once you get about beyond triads and dyads and so forth, the normalizing constant just goes away. It's like literally impossible to calculate the normalizing constant. And this is why these, this literature sort of sat vapid um, uh, for about probably 30 years between the time when the, when the Pollen and Linhart put these papers out to start and when um, uh, uh, the exponential graph, random graph format and the P-star models came out um, uh, with Wasserman and Faust in the, um, uh, in the 90s. And the solution is really kind of clever. And I'm not going to go into the real details of this, but I want to give you just a taste of what the solution is. Because it's one of these things that you know, mathematics statistical types do um, uh, where you go, you know, crimey, that was a good idea, right? And so what they did is you can imagine thinking about this problem. Now, you don't actually do this, but you can think about this problem as if um, I, what I want to do is predict the probability for a tie between i and j holding constant everything else in the graph. So I'm going to condition the probability of a tie between me and Dana as a function of everything else in this room. I'm going to hold it exactly constant. All right, so in order to do that, I'm going to say, well, is the tie between me and Dana a function of our age? Well, if it is, then I might say, let's imagine that I take the graph as it is, and I change, I force the tie to be there between us, right? 
Um, uh, and then I take the same mix graph, holding everything else in the network constant, except for that single dyad, and I force it to be negative, right? So I force it to be off. Then I recalculate z, right, as a function of the tie between us is true, and the tie between us is false. And that's going to change very slightly, right, the homophily principle on, the homophily coefficient on h, if z is a homophily measure of some sort, right? So I'm going to do this over and over and over and over again for each dyad independently, holding constant everything else. And the nice thing about that is, is that once you do that feature, um, after a bunch of algebra, um, you can end up getting the probability that this coefficient, conditional on the complement, on holding everything else constant, right, is there relative to everyone else. You can get this log odds without that kappa feature, right? And so by subtracting the present ties from the absent ties, you've essentially subtracted away the normalizing constant, because the normalizing constant is going to be here in both of these features. Right? So this is what's clever about it. And if you think about what this is doing, what it's saying is now I have the potential to estimate the probability of a tie between two nodes right, without having to calculate the normalizing constant, which has been the um, uh, sort of you know, defining problem all along. And instead, I can do it merely as a function of these different scores. Right. Now, it turns out the different scores can be kind of a pain in the ass to calculate, um, uh, but sometimes they're um, uh, pretty intuitive. And so you can imagine, for example, that the difference, if, if, if I want to go for the simplest possible model, right, it would be that z is just density. It's just whether or not there's a tie there in the graph or not. And so if I force the tie to be present, what's, z, what's the value, how, what, what happens to the value of the number of edges in the graph? Right. If, I, if, I'm at, if my z statistic is the number of edges in the graph, and I force a die to be present, What's z now equal to? Whatever it was plus 1. Right? So now if I force it to be absent, what is it? Whatever it is minus 1. Right? And so what's 1 minus 0? 1. Right? And that's going to be true for every dyad in the model. Right? So what does, this, what does this actual statistic look like? Well, it looks like a vector of 1s. What's a vector of 1s in your logit model? It's the intercept, right? And so it turns out that a lot of these things that are in the graph, right, a lot of these features that we're going to calculate have very intuitive interpretations and they make a lot of sense. We go through some machinations in how we describe the way we calculated them in order to, to make sure that we're sort of honest with what this feature is. But at the end of the day, we end up estimating something that looks very familiar to us, right? Like having an intercept in our logit model, right? So, the, um, uh, the basic problem, the process then for fitting an exponential random graph model is that you first have to specify the model, and we're going to talk about that as, uh, how to do that in a minute. You fit the model. Um, uh, the um, problem with these models are that, um, uh, and I'm going to describe what this means in a second, but there are two classes of parameters. There's diet independent parameters and there's non diet independent parameters. Diet independent parameters we can fit with this basic logit. Non independent parameters, um, uh, the standard errors are just completely useless. And so for that reason, we use these things called MCMC -MC change, which are a way of sampling through the space of all possible graphs. And you do this over and over and over again as an underlying simulation sort of feature in order to calculate effectively the variance of this fit. We examine the goodness of fit. If poor, um, uh, you, know, you return to one and try again. If it's great, publish your paper and go home. Get tenure, um, uh, make lots of money, be famous. Like, remember, remember why we're all here, right? If you're here to get famous, you're in the wrong room. I'm just, just saying. All right, so the first step in this process is to specify the model. And so we specify the model um, uh, by, using these, by defining these different scores, right? And so we have to find, calculate some statistic on z, do the difference on the edge, and then collect all those things up for each edge in the network. Um, and the nice thing is, is the StatNet team um, uh, at the University of Washington put together a bunch of these z scores for us, right? So they're already out there. Uh, you don't have to write the program to go into the MCMC -MC chain and do it. They're already built into the package. The nice thing is, is for those of you that are really ambitious, if you have a particular network feature that you care about, say like you want to really estimate um, the number of groups of size five that has four ties in it, right? So like that's somehow deeply theoretical for you. You can program it in, right? It's kind of a pain in the butt, um, uh, but we we have done it for things like um, a hierarchy, for example. So there is no um, a given term for hierarchy in the in the base package. But um, Jeff Smith and I had a theory about how hierarchy would affect um, a school behaviors, and so we programmed it up. Or to be honest, Jeff programmed it up, um, uh, and I used the result. Um, but the uh, th the point is, you can do that. So what do these kind of parameters look like? 
And so the specifications you can include are things like homophily, right? So, and the, and the basic idea here is that, you know, birds of a feather flock together. And so the um, way that that would look is that we expect more ties within similarity features than between. And we, the term that's in the ergum package for doing this is called node match. And so if I had something like node match gender, and that would say I'm going to fit a single parameter for the probability that it, of a tie falls between people that they're the same gender. Now I could say gender comma diff equals true, and I'd have one parameter for people if they're both male, another parameter if they're both female, and it's relative to people who are of different genders, right? And so you can do lots of different ways of thinking about this. Um, and homophily, oops, sorry, homophily is probably substantively one of the most common features that we we model, or the thing we care about. Um, but it's, um, it's certainly not the, 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 most, the, the only thing you can do. Um, social balance, a friend of a friend should be a friend. That is, when I see a pattern that looks like this, where a friend of a friend is a friend, we would expect that to close, right? And so we can fit that with um, a, a triadic feature um, uh, or something that's called a geometrically weighted, um, uh, this is what the GW stands for, edgewise shared partners, which is an edgewise shared partner is a, um, uh, is a triangle. Um, uh, which is a, it's the world's worst language. I don't know why they use that. Um, we might also talk about something like small worlds, right? So in that case, um, I don't, I you know, don't I know your grandmother or whatever is the kind of way we think about these colloquially. But the idea is that the network might be clustered into lots of pieces, but have some reason to go across. So we can think about differences in clustering again, combined with changes in the length of this distribution. So if my network is characterized by the small world graph, what that means substantively is a combination of two parameters. One parameter that says there's lots of closed ties, either due to homophily or triadic closure, and there's short path distances. Now, it turns out that path distances are a little, a little cumbersome to calculate. So you want to be careful what you put through here. I might go with four paths or something like this, because really long paths can be um, expensive to calculate. But you might also think about something like um, the rich get richer, right? So preferential attachment, oops, where did that happen there? Prefer, woo. Preferential attachment is a theory that says that um, uh, the, the popular people get more ties over time. And so we can fit that by saying that if you have lots of ties already, then the probability of getting more ties is even built in. So we can add in degree or K stars or something like this. Again, because we're doing an entire semester um, uh, in you know, 45 minutes, I'm not going to go through each of these parameters, but there are lots of them there. The nice thing is you can do them for um, bipartite networks or single networks, directed networks or undirected networks. There's lots of different ways you can do it. Um, the common classes of terms that you're going to see in almost all models are probably going to be an edges term, right? So you control for the overall density of the network. You usually have some kind of a sender and receiver effect to, to affect these are, you can think of these as like fixed effects in the network, right? And so you can either do that with a, a parameter literally for each person, or what I typically do is a degree distribution correction. So I, have, I, just, I just treat people who have the same degree as, a, as, exact, as being in a class. Um, often mutuality, if your network is not um, uh, undirected, right? So if you're dealing with something like friendship, you, know, you would expect people to be friends with each other. Um, you have some kind of node um, uh, attribute um, uh, or node factor. So a node cove feature is an attribute difference. Um, uh, so something that um, I send more ties if I'm rich than if I'm poor. A node factor is that um, uh, it's um, uh, a categorical variable. So coves are continuous variable. Factors are um, uh, categorical variables. Node match is all your homophily stuff. <coughs> the geometrically weighted parameters um, uh, for either edgewise shared partners, which is the transitivity term, or non-shared partners um, uh, is the uh, intransitivity term. And so you can add those to the model. And there's lots of other things you can say that, say, a dyad covariate would be we're more likely to be friends if we're also classmates, right? So you can add all these kinds of features to the network um, uh, if you're interested in, in fitting them. And again, if you think about what you're doing, you're thinking about each of those cells of the adjacency matrix and asking, is there some social process that I care about that could distinguish that cell from all the other cells in the network? And if so, I'm going to include it in the, in the, in the model. Now, the key feature here um, uh, is that this is a modeling exercise that really asks you to parameterize a network. And most of us have really crappy intuition about how to parameterize a network. <laughs> and so this is the really difficulty of the um, exponential random graph framework is that you have to be accurate in your model specification. And this is something we're frankly not very used to doing. Um, and so for example, um, uh, if you sort of come to this world from your regression sort of line, you're, you're used to thinking about um, uh, things in a linear standpoint. So if I say a friend of a friend should be a friend, then the more triangles I have in the graph, right, the more likely we should be friends. 
That's exactly what a friend of a friend of a friend is, right? So we would expect that to be true. Just like if I expect that the more education you get, the more money you make, right? I mean, it's a nice linear relationship. And if I'm off a little bit in, in OLS, it's not going to matter that much, right? So I might have heteroscedasticity or something. I might not fit the curve exactly right, but it'll be fine. Um, the problem is, is that because of the, what the MCMC chain is doing under the hood is it's saying, all right, I'm going to try to simulate the graph using this permutation kind of idea, I'm going to simulate the graph given the set of parameters that you've specified in the model, so something like a positive effect for transitivity. And as a simulation routine, um, uh, this simulation model says I should increase the number of, of triads that are in my network, so I'm going to add an edge. That makes me happy. It, including, it improves the, um, uh, the objective function of the, uh, of the MCMC chain, um, uh, and so that's great, and so I do it. But in the process of creating that edge, now I've probably opened a bunch of new two paths between other people. <coughs> what that's saying is, in a simulation process, the model is saying is that if this is good, is having a handful of closed triads is good, then certainly having lots of closed triads is better, right? Because you've specified the model like this, a linear parameter. And so what that's going to do then, if I add a triad, the triadic closure term, just a straight linear triad term to the model, it's going to jump itself as fast as it can into a clique. <coughs> and in fact, what it's going to do is it's going to give you, because you're drawing a sample of networks from a population and a distribution, and if um, my uh, transitive term is 0.3, right, if I, if I expect to find 30% of my um, uh, triads to be closed in the real world, what it's going to do is it's going to generate 100 networks, 30 of which are completely closed, and 60 of which are completely empty. right? And so it'll match on the mean, right? That's what the MCMC chain is doing over a thousand iterations, or sorry, a thousand draws of this chain, um, or, or tens of thousands in many cases. Um, uh, and so it'll look from the model coefficient like it's right, right? You've hit the right spot, but no single predicted network that comes out of the posterior distribution will ever be right. right? This is known as a degeneracy problem. And it was dis we discovered it um, uh, in you know, the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and before it was a real pain in the butt. Now we won't let you estimate this model, <laughs> frankly. If you type this model into the StatNet package and say, do this, they'll say, that's a bad model. <laughs> we can't do that. Um, and it'll kick it out. And instead, what you have to do is you have to think about what the actual social process is. And so the way, the social, the, the way you might think about this is that there are diminishing marginal returns to closed um, uh, triads because none of us have infinite energy, right? So as, because I only have so much social engagement I can engage with people with, really ugly sentence. I only have so much time um, uh, with which I can engage people, right? I'm going to spend a lot of time with my close friends, and then, you know, the fifth or sixth or seventh or eighth person, right, I might not be worried about them quite as much. And so this idea that, that a friend of a friend is a friend is too simple of a colloquialism, right? It is that my best friends are friends with each other, right, but acquaintances not so much. And so you have these geometrically weighted or diminishing marginal returns kind of ideas. And that's true for most of these kinds of complicated structural features. The good news is it doesn't matter so much for homophily or reciprocity because these things really only depend on the two people. And so when we say that some features are dyadic independent, what that means is that whatever that Z statistic is, it's only a function of two nodes in the network. And the beauty of that being a function of only the two nodes in the network, it's always going to be conditional on whatever else is going on in the network is irrelevant. And so you don't get these kinds of um, uh, rapid unfolding. Um, but if you have triads, if you have two paths, if you have other kinds of sequences that where a, the, a tie between two people is some function of a tie among some other third or fourth or fifth person in the network, then those features are non-dyadic independent, and you can really get these kinds of chaining features. So you need to think very carefully about how you specify the network. Does that make sense? Clear? Awesome. So the way these models look, once you put, throw them into R and kick them out, is they look like a regression model. And this is why our old school intuition about how to estimate them kicks right in. Right? So in this case, I have a model. I'm going to say Framingham High School. Um, uh, with, that's not Framingham. Like, it's Faux Magnolia High. Frame, I'm thinking of the Christophe and Fowler. So the Faux Magnolia High School is the network they're dealing with here. Ergum is the, um, uh, the routine. So the network is a function of an edges parameter, which is just an intercept a node match on being in the same grade or not, plus a node match on being in the same race or not, plus a node match on being in sex. Right, so this is a, a three-term homophily network, right, or model, and we find that there's a negative density coefficient. These are on the log-odd scales, so all the negative means is that you have, um, a, a, it's a sparse network. 
if this value were zero, then the probability of an edge would be 0.5, right? So it's, it's really just relative to 0.5. And so people get, I've seen like these crazy papers where people like say, well, there's really a, a negative um, uh, effect of density in this network and no one, like people don't like to be friends with each other. Like that's way over interpreting this coefficient, right? This is literally the intercept of the model. And if you only have it in the model, you take, you exponentiate that coefficient, you recover the density of your graph. So that's all it is. Um, but these other ones are substantially interpreted. So this is saying that, you're, that the log odds of a tie between two people um, uh, who are in the same grades um, uh, is about 0.3. If you exponentiate that, which I haven't done here, that's a really big number, right? So this is, the Magnolia High School has very strong clustering on grade. It has pretty strong clustering on race um, uh, and um, uh, a not insignificant um, uh, amount of clustering on sex, right? And the beauty of this is unlike that little mixing matrix example I showed you before, which I could in theory do this way, right, it does it automatically. I don't have to imagine a giant um, three-dimensional cross tab where I do a random Bernoulli in each cell. It'll do it for us parametrically. And that's what's nice about that. Right. It is an MCMC -MC sampling process, right? So what it's actually doing under the hood is it's doing that Z change statistic, comparing that to the objective function that does it actually fit the graph that we've, that we've given it as our object. Um, uh, does the simulated network work? And, it's, and if not, it tries a different parameter. And it sort of goes through the space of all the parameters. And if you have a big model, that's a really big parameter space. And it's going to have to search those pieces. And that's what all the time takes. And the way an MCMC -MC chain works is that if you get to the right spot in the MCMC -MC chain, then it's, that it should be the case that the next, the, the next graph you get is effectively a random draw from the distribution. Once it's converged, Right, then you're just drawing randomly from the space of um, uh, graphs given this converged set. And so what you want to see when you do the diagnostics are these nice sort of random series, right? That your coefficients are just bouncing right around zero. Um, uh, there's no trend to them. They're not going out um, uh, and doing something nuts. Um, uh, and that's a, a, a nice thing to, to look for. And there's a whole set of diagnostics that you can run on these models. Um, the other thing, of course, you can do is you can um, uh, simulate, once you have a probability model of a graph, and this is one of the, the, the most fun things about these features, is once I have a probability model of the graph, I can generate the posterior distribution from that model. I can simulate networks with any kind of feature I want, right? So if you want to do network simulation, it's really nice to be able to say, let's estimate a model on a school that has the exact same amount of, I'm going to say, you know, uh, homophily on grade. Um, I'll simulate a network from that, look at what that network looks like, and I can ask whether or not the simulated network, that is a random draw from the class of all possible graphs given matching on grade, race, and sex, and compare that to my observed network. And that then allows us a way to do a fit statistics by asking whether or not our model, right, that we predicted from the class of all graphs defined by this model, whether or not our observed graph is, could have been a reasonable draw from that set of graphs. And it will always match the parameters you put in the model. So you usually compare it to, param to parameters you didn't put in the model. And so in this case, we didn't put the degree distribution in the model. If you just simulate a bunch of networks a thousand times from that, from that model, you get a, an observed degree distribution that looks like these um, a coefficient, like these box plots. And we see that the observed distribution is here. Right? So this is the observed degree distribution. And it's within the 95% credible rounds in this case. Um, but it's not the same shape, right? So it's probably not a particularly good fit. In this case, the number of triangles we observe, the number of edgewise shared partners, right? The, the, net, the model predicts almost none of these. So the, the, most of the mass is on zero. Um, in fact, we observe a fair number of them. So, so this model that's only based on homophily probably doesn't fit very well. So what this is telling us we might need to add a degree parameter. We might need to add a reciprocity parameter. We might need to add a closed triad parameter of some sort. So some way to capture the features that aren't being captured just by race um, uh, in the, or, and gender and homophily. Right? And so this is the way, this is the process of fitting these kinds of models. Well, this is an example from the StatNet team from one of the first papers they produced on this, on this work where they were looking at um, uh, the ad health schools <clears throat> and they had a bunch of um, node covariates. So whether or not you're in grade eight through 12, for example, your race, your gender. And these are the, the probability of a person sending a tie. These are covariates with being socially active. And we find that eighth graders, um, attend, and this is all relative to seventh graders, so eighth graders send more ties than seventh graders, but not so much. It turns out that um, uh, the most uh, sort of socially expansive group are 11th graders. 12th graders are a little bit down, and it's probably because they're sending ties outside the school or something like that. Right? Then we have a series of um, 
matching parameters, so it turns that seventh graders are much more likely to nominate each other than they are to nominate anyone else in the world. Um, uh, and it turns out the sophomores are the least likely, or juniors are the least likely to nominate each other. But again, more than you'd expect by chance. And these are the kind of ways you interpret this. The nice piece about this is this is a, a box plot because there's 121 schools here. And so this is a coefficient for each of the schools. Please. So how do you group it over multiple schools? Or how do you feel about this? You have more networks. Do you think there's structural zeros and try and get one model that's all of them? Or do you meta analysis? Yeah, that's a great question. For those that didn't hear, it's like, how do you actually fit these models on multiple schools simultaneously? You, so the, the, the first question is the estimation feature. You do it as a loop, right? So you would do it for each, you know, for it. You create a list of all school IDs. And you say for all schools, you know, one to the last ID, run your model. Um, and then you store out the fit statistics from those features and you try to find a set of models that fit reasonably well in all schools. Now, most of the time, you won't find a model that fits equally well in every school. And so instead what you can do, and so then you have to ask yourself whether or not you want to keep the exact, do you want to, you want to prioritize a constant model or a, a better fit? My sense has been that, um, uh, that oftentimes if I'm interested in a particular subset of parameter, um, uh, I, will, I will fix the parameters to zeros for schools where they don't, where it isn't relevant. So for example, if I have a school without any um, African Americans in that school, it's an all white school, then having a homophily parameter for black is irrelevant. It's, it's not, it doesn't mean anything. So in that school, I'd set that to zero. Um, or Because that's what, it, I mean, if you think about what your model is, right, a model is um, a set of, of non-zero coefficients and an infinite set of, of, of terms in your model where the coefficient has been by default set to zero because you didn't include it in the model, right? And so all you can do is just do that directly and then it will converge, right? So you can say, you can say all right, this will work for that set. And then yes, you, I'm gonna do a meta-analysis. So like, once you actually get all the coefficients out, you can put it into a standard me, um, HLM meta-analysis kind of program and you can look for trends across schools or something like this. Um, there's a, a the um, Gary Robbins um, standalone package PNET um, uh, will now do a uh, multi-level model ergoms um, uh, in one fell swoop. Um, the problem of, of doing it in one fell swoop is that um, these, each of these, um, especially once you start adding in structural parameters like triadic closure or something, these can be really slow to converge. Um, and there's a lot of effort that goes into making sure they converge. Um, and so, that, so if you're gonna do um, that and try to estimate them all simultaneously and then pull out the covariance structure and do it that way. It's all simultaneously and then go back and reestimate the pieces. It can be a real slog to get through. And so just from a, just from a saving yourself, you know, getting your paper done before you um, come up for tenure, I recommend doing it separately and using the meta-analysis. Yeah. Paper that myself, um, uh, Dan McFarlane, and Jeff Smith did did exactly this. <laughs> so I recommend um, uh, starting there. Um, uh, but the, but your intuition is exactly right. So but, but instead of going to the literature and pulling out the coefficient standard errors from the table, you just generate the tables yourself for each school, right? You generate the coefficient standard errors um, uh, and pieces and use them. Um, yes, you, to, to, uh, literally what you're doing is an old school um, HLM model by hand, right? So, yeah, and, it's, and it's, it's really no more complicated than that. It's really kind of nice that way, yeah. Um, because what you're going to generate are a series of coefficients across 120 schools or a bunch of different teams or whatever. I have all those coefficients, I have all the fit statistics, I have the standard errors, and I can run it whatever way, way from Sunday, right? And so I have a level two feature like school administration, I can then use that to predict the coefficients at level one. Now, hopefully you do something smart when you do this, right? So if you're using the ad health schools, right, for example, um, uh, it's the case that we really shouldn't treat each of these schools as independent because the junior high is paired with the high school. So we might want to have corrections at the level two the fact that we're in the same community. So they're clustering, things like this you might do. Um, uh, whereas if you're just pulling coefficients from uh, literature reviews, you have to assume that each study is independent. That's not necessarily the case here. So there's covariance structure features you can add to fix that. Um, and, there's, and with all sort of you know, big, complex, multi-level models, there's convergence issues. And so what we might like to have is a, a completely unstructured covariance matrix in order to allow the data to tell us what's happening. But that's never going to converge. So there's going to be something to make that work. All right. So this is a paper that, um, <clears throat> again, Dan, Jeff, and I worked on 
on network ecology. And our idea was to think about a really simple in-school model um, uh, where we'd imagine sort of some features that we think are common across American high schools. That is, it's the things that you can imagine if you're writing a screenplay about um, uh, high schools, right, these are the features you're going to include, right? So there's a hierarchy structure, there's um, strong reciprocity, probably differential by gender, right? There's race segregation, gender segregation, um, uh, and uh, you know, for cool kids and not cool kids. We were particularly interested um, uh, in this hierarchy coefficient, so the ways in which um, uh, some settings select schools to be more Lord of the Flies-like and others that are more sort of kumbaya-like, right? So there are things that schools can do to increase the um, uh, sort of relevance of natural status hierarchy. The argument here is not too dissimilar from saying that adolescents and chimps are basically the same. I mean, left to their own devices, they're going to create a pecking order and beat the hell out of each other, right? Um, and so. Um, uh, is, that, is that true? And it turns out to be the case that um, uh, we can estimate these features. And some things about the school, um, uh, very small features in the um, change in the uh, hierarchy coefficient can have really strong differences. Um, uh, so sort of this, this combination of hierarchy and clustering can create a very rap, wildly different sets of schools. So in some schools, you're going to end up with um, uh, both, again, it's a two by two, as Craig told you, I can't help myself. Um, uh, you end up with you know, really high clustering but low hierarchy. This is sort of a collection of cliques um, uh, with lots of self loops in these types of schools. Whereas over here, where you have really low reciprocity and low clustering but very high hierarchy, this is your Lord of the Fly chimp world, right? And it turns out um, uh, that um, you know, if, you, if, if you favor a world where, that is of, of, sort of social equality and um, uh, lots of reciprocity and not super, sort of, super high status hierarchies in schools, you need to kind of crack down on students, right? So the less freedom you give them, the more organizational structure you give them, the more foci you put them in, where, you, where, they're, where they're not able to self-select into their own little pieces, the more likely they are to be good human beings. Um, uh, if, you, if left to their own, to sort of just do whatever they want to do, they're going to self-segregate by all their attributes, and they're going to have um, a sort of a really strong um, uh, hierarchy and pecking order. And um, this probably shouldn't surprise us developmentally um, uh, that, you know, that giving structure to adolescents actually helps them um, uh, behave in ways that they might not otherwise behave. It's probably not a surprise to any parent in the room. Um, uh, but, this is the, uh, the, but it turns out that this is sort of a nice thing you can do about the way you socially organize. Um, so questions and comments on the ergot models. We're, we're getting close to the end on this set. More or less. All right. Um, I didn't. All right, we're close. Um, so the, the ergon model has the advantage, you know, is it a feature, is it a bug? It has the advantage of um, respecting the model you specify, right? So if, if I specify a structural model about reciprocity or transitivity or hierarchy, um, the model will estimate exactly that model. Um, if I don't know of much about my social setting, I'm very likely to have a misspecified model. A misspecified model is going to have a hard time fitting. Now, there's a whole exploration process you can go through to try to learn about your networks. But in, in practice, it's really easy to specify a bad ergon model. And if you specify a bad ergon model, it doesn't fit, it doesn't converge, it's like a real pain in your ass. Um, and if you're the kind of person who's really just interested in figuring out whether or not there's an association between two features in my network, right, whether or not it's the case that, um, uh, you know, say that uh, you know, people who are um, uh, rich are also popular, I don't care about the rest of the structure then the single best advance in these kinds of networks are known as latent space models. And a latent space model um, uh, is a model where you imagine, um, do I have a good example here? There we go. Um, uh, we imagine that there's some probability of observing my network conditional on features that I'm going to specify and your position in some unspecified, unknown, computer-generated latent space. And the logic here is that if we're close in the space, then we're likely to be tied. If we're distant in the space, we're not likely. This is exactly analogous to those graph layout algorithms I told you about yesterday, right? And so the thinking is, instead of trying to specify ahead of time that it's being diff really different in terms of our um, uh, income or our education or how much we like you know, popular music, right? instead of try as me and an analyst having to figure out what that is, I'm just going to let the computer figure it out. Right? I'm going to say, let's invent a new variable, right? call it z. And we're going to give z two dimensions. And we're going to say, if you're close in those two dimensions, you're tied. And I'm just going to let the computer figure out what those dimensions are. 
the nice thing about that way of doing it, though, if anybody's ever done principal component analysis or worked on um, uh, singular value decompositions or any other kind of latent variable model in psychometrics, this is exactly the same idea. But instead we're now applying it to tie probability instead of the similarity in it and a set of variables in a, in a model. And what's nice is that we can then um, uh, generate a model that we position people in the Z space. This is a nice two-dimensional version so we can actually plot from the model. And we can say this is where each person fits in this Z space. And we can see that they have a very nice likelihood of being tied. And in this case, because it's an example from the paper that was published to admit the method, um, it fits quite nicely, right? So you don't have a lot of ties zooming across the space because we've invented the space such that the ties should be short in, in the display space instead of two dimensions. Because it's a probabilistic model, we can then sample from the posterior distribution um, uh, of this network. And we can generate a cloud of points that says this is roughly where person A is. This is roughly where person B is. Person A and person B um, are pretty close to each other all the time, and they're always pretty different from person B, right? This is the way of thinking about this latent space, is that I can generate um, a, a feature. Now, the beauty of a latent space is that it almost always fits, right? Um, uh, and if it doesn't fit in two dimensions, I bet it fits in three. If it doesn't fit in three, I bet it fits in four, right? And so you can always let you, be, if your network has anything other than pure random structure, you're going to be able to find a latent space that fits the network. The problem is it's completely unknowable what these dimensions mean, right? And so as a, I love latent space models when all I care about is correcting away the network structure, right? When I don't want to worry about model sophistication too much, but, I, but there is some feature, some alpha that I want, whoa, what can I just do? Right? Um, if there's some feature that I want to correct for, um, uh, right, if I really care about this association between, um, uh, you know, like popularity and um, income or whatever, um, and I want to say that people who are um, uh, different on some observed variable, and I want to control for everything else, a latent space is the single best way to do it. Um, if instead what you want to do is just explore a setting and you don't have any really good way of exploring it, you might um, uh, engage in the process where you play this out, you look at it and you go, oh, yeah, those are Democrats and those are Republicans, right? And it might become obvious when you look at the latent space and who's in it, what, what's governing it, then you add those in as um, uh, explicit variables, right? So it's, as part of a model building process, the latent space approach can be really nice for um, identifying the features that are governing a um, uh, high probability in your, in your network. But fundamentally, it becomes just like anybody else um, who's ever done a scale construction process, right? Um, uh, you, know, you take six or seven um, variables that you hope work together. Um, uh, and then you um, name it something your sure reviewers will love, um, uh, and um, that's what it is. That's kind of what happens with the latent space, right? And so uh, it, it, it's a really nice way to fit, but it's really hard to know exactly what it means. But again, sometimes that's great. It, it, it depends on what you want. Um, uh, this is another example. One of the nice things about the latent space model is um, you might think from this kind of a picture that it has to be a continuous space. In fact, you can add groups to it so I can have both the latent space and clustering, and so that, that creates a, a lot of um, it need not be essentially a Euclidean space. Go ahead. So you create the um, pre-metric variance that we would call the latent one, the like the Gilbert back analysis, and the first one you described. Yeah, that's a perfectly reasonable analysis. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, the difference, the the, the the notion is that you can add in this kind of feature where effectively, um, uh, you know, if we're in the same group, the distance matters more than if we're in different groups. Right. So that would be a way of saying that instead of forcing a metric space on this distance, I'm going to create this clustering that is above and beyond, which is a latent space way of dealing with a triadic closure. Effect. And there's lots of different models of this. I don't know why I had this. This is one of the Prosper data sets. Um, one of the nice things about these data, and I didn't bring the um, example with me. I, I meant to. One of the nice things about this, um, uh, these models is that the latent space models can also be a little more robust to missing data, right? So remember, the thing about the generative model that you're getting out of the ergoms is you are um, saying that I'm going to, that the observed graph, the exact observed graph that I have in front of me is a sample from the class of all similar graphs. Well, some of that similarity is just error, right? So you know, some kids didn't fill out the survey or being jokesters and naming themselves or all kinds of things, right? And so the latent space tends to be a little more robust to just data error um, uh, because it has this idea that, you know, like, I don't know what this thing is. It might be my propensity to be a jackass in high school, right? And so it, does, it doesn't really matter. It's just going to correct for it as it's there. 
Um, and so one of the things that um, uh, uh, Jake Fisher um, did is he said, um, we, we're used to thinking about this network as if it's really the thing that's driving diffusion, for example. But if we think that there's a lot of error in this observed network, then what we might really care about is whether or not we're close in this space. So then once I get a space generated, I can think about your distance in the space, and then I can use a spatial diffusion model on the latent space as opposed to a network diffusion model. So it does open lots of opportunities for thinking about this kind of problem. All right, um, the latent space models tend to be much more robust model specification in the ergon. I just said that. They have better convergent properties, but they tend to um, uh, have this um, uh, sort of, you know, essentially just unknowability about what's there. I've lost my slides, so I don't know what's coming next. So the, the most recent addition to this panoply of models um, uh, that are out there is the AMEN models, which is arguably the best name for a model um, uh, because once it's converged, this is what you're going to say. Um, uh, uh, but it's called the Additive and Multiplicative Effects Model. Um, uh, it's uh, invented by Peter Hoff and Alex Volkowski, who are both professors in our stats department here. Um, uh, and if we um, uh, spin up, as we're planning to do, an advanced version of this seminar um, uh, in alternate years, um, uh, they will give us an entire day on just these models. But um, for our purposes, the idea is that you can think about this as a two-dimensional problem, um, uh, this notion of what an adjacency matrix is, and then you can add all kinds of things. And one of the key elements that they do is they sort of move it into a variance components approach, right? So instead of thinking about this in the, in the old style log linear approach with rows and columns, we can think about this as different types of error structures. So you have a row error structure, a column error structure, and a dyad error. And then you can model each of those errors in the same way that you would um, a variance components model in a HLM framework. And this allows you to add all kinds of really nice features to the model. So they can be really, um, uh, you can have um, really interesting interaction effects. You can have a latent space model. So once I think about, um, in this case, I might have a covariance feature between the sender and the receiver, which is effectively, um, uh, the, you know, this is a be one vector and another sort of multiplied by each other. This becomes a space, for those of you that are trying to parse the crazy notation. But so this becomes the latent space model, right? And so things like latent space models just get folded into the hood of this piece. And it's a really nice effect. And they spent a lot of time working on the um, software itself. So it's an R package, not unsurprising for our stats department. Um, uh, and it's a, um, what's nice about it is you can literally it, just specify the models very simply. So they actually are typing out the model. Do I have an example here? I don't. Um, uh, but when you type out the models, um, uh, it's a nice clean um, uh, exposition of the models, um, which is masking a huge amount of stuff happening under the hood. Right. Um, and so these models are great. They're a little slow to converge. Um, so if you have networks of, you know, a couple hundred nodes, it might take an hour for the most complicated ones to converge, maybe a day if it's really complicated. Um, uh, I had a student who was doing some international networks. So these were networks that are like 150 to 200 nodes. Um, and they were taking a really long time to do it. So you have to, again, you want to play with these models, get to know them. Always start with the simplest model in your exploration phase and figure out what you're doing. Um, uh, and so the trade-off between you know, syntactic simplicity is often computationally complexity. So there's a lot of stuff under the hood that's happening that's going to take a long time. But the reason to use these models is that you can add, they, they create a nice combination of the um, uh, latent space features with nonlinear specifications of the other kinds of variables. All right, questions, comments, thoughts on these pieces thus far? Please. Um, they, you, ha you have to specify, um, uh, so there's a default specification, right, which is going to, in this case, and so the, the question was how do you distinguish the latent space position from the um, random error, correct? Yeah, so they do it by, um, uh, by essentially creating, um, uh, remember the way Bria talked about parsing out separate buckets of variance? They actually just say, well, one of the buckets of variance is going to be the latent space. So it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a slick model. <laughs> um, and as a general rule, um, uh, if Peter Hoff says do it, um, you probably should. That's just, um, you know, that's, as we in, when in doubt, follow Peter. That's the, that, that's the rule. Um, what time is this? We're supposed to be done at 10.30? All right, so I have some slides here on missing data. I'm not going to go into them I'm, uh, for the interest of time. If we end up, you're, like, I'm here all day. So I'm only shooting for myself, but you've got to be exhausted. Um, so, if, so look at the slides. 
The main point about missing data, just to get to the to the really to the um, uh, to the, to the, you know to the to the crux of the issue, is if you go back to this idea of um, predicting an adjacency matrix, right, as a series of row columns, effects, or whatever, is all missing data is is a subset of these rows and columns that you don't know the answer to. And so whatever features I use to fit the rest of the model, if I have those features for the marginals or, the, or something else, I can fit it to this same thing, right? And so it turns out that missing data, especially if it's, if, it's, if it's node level missing data, some kids didn't fill out my survey, but I know what kinds of kids they are, right? Then I can add a distribution assumption for their degree and I can fill it right in. And it seems kind of nice. The difficult one is when you have dyad level missing data. So if it's the, and the, and the reason it's difficult is not because it's a difficult modeling process. It's difficult because you don't know that it's actually missing data, right? All you know, I say, this is going to look like a zero to you. It's not going to look like a missing data key. And the most common time this occurs is when you have a truncated instrument. So if I only allow you to nominate five ties and you have 10 friends, that means that five of the rows in this cell and this, and five of the cells in this row are missing because you wanted to call them friends and I didn't give you the opportunity. I just don't know which ones they are. Right. So those are a little harder to fix because you because effectively for those in the machine learning world you don't have any training data right you don't know which the cases is you're trying to predict um, but the, the solution is to use a distributional effect and say well given everything else I know about you I would expect this person to be your friend but you didn't name them it's probably because you didn't have the opportunity to name them, right and that's the way these kind of models work and the nice thing about the amen package is you can just say bit missing data <laughs> just click and off it goes all right. All right, let's take a break. I'm uh, up and move around, get something to drink, I'm, uh, uh, and we'll come back for 